As still breathing heavily, Eric made the call. His voice cried as he screamed into the phone. Someone killed my parents. After the murders, the Menendez brothers told the authorities that they had come home to find their parents brutally murdered. They described it as a shocking discovery, explaining how they had come home and found their parents brutally murdered. They described an unknown intruder who had attacked their parents for reasons they couldn't understand. The emotional strain was mounting, especially for Eric, and the brothers began attending therapy to cope with the stress and trauma of their parents' deaths. Eric, in particular, struggled with the pressure and found it increasingly difficult to manage the weight of what had happened. As the investigation progressed, detectives began to look deeper into the details. The brothers continued to cooperate, answering questions, and sticking to their story. They attended interviews, responded to inquiries, and continued to present themselves as grieving sons. But during a therapy session, Eric talked to his therapist, Dr. Jerome Mazil, and revealed every horrifying detail of that fateful night. A confession that would change everything. It was late, nearly 10 p.m. on a quiet August night in Beverly Hills. Inside the Menendez mansion, the air was still, but tension had already been brewing beneath the surface. Lyle and Eric Menendez stood outside. Lyle glanced at Eric, his jaw clenched. He wiped his palm on his jeans, shifting the shotgun's weight in his hands. Eric's breath came in short, Ottoman burst. His fingers trembling slightly, tightening around the suck of the gun, knuckles white. Lyle's voice, barely more than a whisper, cut through the silence. It's time. He reached for the door with cold determination. Eric's eyes flickered with uncertainty, but he gave a small, barely noticeable nod. Their footsteps were slow, methodical. Lyle moved with a calculated confidence, leading the way as Eric trailed behind. Each step felt heavier than the last. Their muscles tied with dread, but there was no turning back now. Inside, Jose Menendez sat on the living room couch, room in hand, watching TV. His wife, Kiri, lounged nearby. The scene was deceptively peaceful. The brothers crept inside, trying to make no sound. Eric's hands trembled as he tightly gripped the weapon. While Lyle kept his eyes fixed ahead, their footsteps were almost drowned by the sound of the TV. Without a word, Lyle raised the shotgun and fired, first at his father, Jose. The impact was immediate, violent. Lyle spread across the room, sending the prison walls. Jose slumped back, lifeless. Kiri screamed. In that instant, chaos exploded in the room. She scrambled to get away, her footsteps frantic, but the brothers weren't done. Eric aimed, but his hands shook uncontrollably. He missed. She stumbled, crashing to the floor. Another shot ranged out, then another. They fired until their parents were silent, until the mansion echoed with nothing but the faint hum of the television. For a moment, it felt as though time had frozen. The brothers stood there, panting, surveying the devastation. Blood pulled on the floor beneath their parents' bodies. But there was no turning back. They had made their decision. In the days after the murders, Lyle and Eric Menendez didn't act like grieving sons. There were no tears, no public displays of mourning. Instead, it was as if a burden had been lifted off their shoulders. The mansion that had once been filled with tension and fear now felt to them like a place of freedom. Lyle seemed almost reborn, walking with a confidence that had been missing for years. He bought a Rolex watch, the gleam of it reflecting his newfound sense of control. Eric followed suit, indulging in designer clothes and an expensive sports car. The brothers didn't just spend, they indulged. Like men who had been denied for too long, and now finally, they had the chance to take everything they wanted. Lavish vacations became the norm. They flew first class, stayed in luxurious hotels, and surrounded themselves with opulence. Their spending caught attention quickly, neighbors whispered, friends raised their brows, and detectives took notice. How could two young men who had just lost their parents in such a brutal fashion act so carefree? The lavish purchases, the carefree demeanor, it didn't sit right. The men and those brothers seemed to have moved on too easily, too comfortably. It wasn't grief, it was something else. And the more they spent, the more suspicions grew. Their behavior didn't align with their story, and people began to wonder if there was more to the tragedy than met the eye. Eric Menendez sat in Dr. Rosil's office, his face pale, his eyes hollow. He shifted nervously in his chair, his fingers fumbling with the seam of his chair. Dr. Ozil watched him closely. Eric's breath was shaky as he finally spoke. His voice was barely more than a whisper, cracking under the pressure. He said, I can't keep this inside anymore. We, we killed them. Eric finally confessed. 
His voice breaking, he glanced at Ozil, his eyes filled with a mix of fear and expression. He couldn't hold back any longer. The words thumbed out a flow of anguish and guilt that had been bottled up for far too long. Eric described everything, the plan, the shotgun, the way his father slumped back lifeless. He spoke of Kira's screams, the shots that echoed through the room, and the silence that followed. Dr. Ozil listened, his eyes never leaving Eric's face. Taking in every word, every tremor, every movement, on and to Eric, Dr. Ozil recorded their sessions. He knew the significance of this moment. It was a confession that could change everything. After the therapy session, Eric returned home, his mind heavy with the weight of his confession. He found Lyle in the living room. Lyle looked up as Eric walked in, immediately sensing something was wrong. Eric informed Lyle that he had confessed everything to Dr. Ozil. Lyle was immediately alarmed, realizing the potential consequences of Eric's actions. He knew they were now at risk, and they needed to figure out how to deal with this situation. Lyle urged Eric to stay calm, emphasizing that they would have faced whatever came next together, but they needed to be careful and avoid any further mistakes. Lyle couldn't let the confession hang over them without taking action. He decided to confront Dr. Ozil, hoping to control the damage. The next day, Lyle went to Dr. Ozil's office. He was determined, his face set with a mixture of fear and anger. Lyle demanded to speak with Ozil in private. Once they were alone, Lyle wasted no time, his voice low and tense as he confronted the therapist. He told Dr. Ozil that Eric had spoken out of expression, that none of it was meant to be taken seriously. Lyle tried to intimidate Ozil, his words laced with veiled threats, making it clear that keeping the confession quiet was in everyone's best interest. Dr. Ozil listened, his expression unreadable. He knew the gravity of the situation and the risk involved. Lyle's attempt to coerce him only made the therapist more aware of the potential danger. Dr. Ozil, understanding the weight of the confession and his responsibility, reported the details to the authorities. The police, now armed with their direct confession, began their investigation with renewed focus. They gathered the necessary evidence, corroborating Eric's account, with the physical evidence from the crime scene. Not long after, police arrived at the Menendez mansion. Eric and Lyle were taken by surprise. There was no time to prepare, no time to run. The officers moved swiftly, arresting both brothers without resistance. As they were led away in handcuffs, the reality of the situation hit them. The confessor they had tried to maintain crumbled, replaced by the cold, hard truth of what they had done. The trial that followed was nothing short of a media spectacle. Cameras flashed, headlines screamed about the Menendez brothers, and the courtroom became the stage for one of the most sensational trials in American history. Lyle and Eric's defense centered on their claims of enduring years of emotional and sexual abuse at the hands of their father, Jose Menendez. Public opinion was deeply divided. Some saw the brothers as cold-blooded killers, driving by greed and the desire for their parents' fortune. Others believed they were victims, pushed to their breaking point by years of unimaginable trauma. As each new detail emerged, the nation was captivated, and the media fanned the flames of controversy. Throughout the trial, Lyle and Eric often appeared tense, their expression shifting from anger to vulnerability as details of their childhood emerged. The defense painted a harrowing picture of life under Jose's control. Testimonies from family, friends, and former household staff described incidents of explosive rage, with Jose's demanding absolute obedience. There were accounts of Lyle being rated and humiliated for minor mistakes, and Eric being forced to injure lying, frightening lectures late into the night. The brothers spoke of the emotional manipulation and the constant fear they lived under, a fear that followed them every waking moment. Gasps echoed through the courtroom during graphic descriptions of the abuse, while the prosecution pushed back hard, arguing the murders were premeditated, motivated by greed. After weeks of intense trial proceedings, the jury finally delivered their verdict. Both Lyle and Eric Menendez were found guilty of first degree murder. The courtroom fell silent as the brothers' fate was sealed, life in prison without the possibility of parole. The media frenzy intensified, with some celebrating justice served, while others questioned whether the system had ignored the brothers' claims of abuse. In the years that followed, the Menendez brothers became a symbol of a deeply divided public. Some viewed them as a killer driving by greed, others as broken sons forever haunted by their past. The case remains a point of debate, with petitions for their release and documentaries revisiting the controversial trial. 
But in the end, the brothers remained behind bars, their lives forever shaped by the events of that fateful August night.